Thank you all for joining us for live Q&A with Jeffrey Mackey Mason from the University of California's Publisher Negotiation Team. This session is a complement to the bite-sized lunchtime talk you've already watched. Once again, Jeffrey Mackey Mason is a university librarian and chief digital SLE. Since taking the helm at the Berkeley Library, he has been a leader in the UC drive to flip the scholarly publishing industry to open access, making all research available to read for free. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you mean me, you're quite welcome. I'm delighted I to do, be here. I do, I do mean you, yes. <laughs> I thought you, you, the... you meant all the participants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean all you. <laughs> all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so let's jump right in. So we have a few folks uh, in the room uh, who are going to be asking questions. We've also taken some questions from Slack uh, from uh, other members of our team uh, who are in research rooms right now. Amanda, could you please go ahead and turn off uh, the little notification too uh, for the dings for when people arrive. All right, why don't we start uh, with uh, your origin story uh, with the UC Publishers Negotiation Team. So I know folks coming from other systems, standalone private campuses are very curious uh, about how, to, how this sort of all emerged. So can you tell us how you got involved with the UC Publishers Negotiation Team and what was your path like to becoming co-chair? Uh, sure. Um... I arrived at Berkeley in the fall of 2015, October 2015, um, from the University of Michigan, where I was for 29 years on the faculty and then uh, as the Dean of the School of Information. Um, I, I mean, a few things came together. First, I'd been working on issues of scholarly publishing and the uh, economics of information production, particularly in digital form and information transmission over the internet. I'm an information economist. Uh, is my field of research. I've been working on that since the mid nineties, uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Um, and then I came to Berkeley as the university librarian. Uh, so was now among other things responsible for the journal licenses. We spend about $12 million a year at Berkeley on subscribing to scholarly journals. Uh, they are expensive and there are a lot of them. Um, so it was in my area of responsibility, uh, what we were paying for and on, on what terms. Um, the University of California is a single university with 10 campuses, uh, including you know, Berkeley, UCLA, San Diego, and so forth. They're all pretty familiar. Um, and the university librarians from the 10 campuses have a council that meets because we do a lot of activity collaboratively across the system, including <clears throat> the subscription licenses for the most in demand uh, publishers. Um, we have what we call tier one licenses, which are system-wide licenses for subscriptions, uh, where we negotiate jointly to get a single license for the entire system, uh, and then use our bargaining power, if you will, from being a, a bigger purchaser to get good terms, as good terms as we can for the system. So that's, that's one of the responsibilities is dealing with that. Um, I have been uh, a supporter of open access for a long time. I've been working on this as an economist. And I now had some uh, uh, formal responsibilities for it. And we got to talking uh, very shortly after I arrived in, uh, at Berkeley in our Council of University Librarians about possibly developing a new, more aggressive approach to move publishing towards open access, something that most scholars have wanted really since the uh, internet became commercially viable in the mid nineties. Uh, we've all been pushing for open access. There hadn't been much progress in 25 years, but there were talk, there was talk about new ways of going about it. So I got very interested in that, got very involved in those discussions. They involve a new business model and a new economic approach. And so my expertise in economics, I think uh, helped me uh, uh, immediately participate in those discussions, even though I was the new kid in town. We decided to develop a strategic plan for the system. Um, my campus, uh, my library had a team in our Office of Scholarly Communications with a lot of expertise. So I volunteered us to be the leaders for developing that strategic plan for the system. So my team and I uh, set that up. It was a collaboration across the system, but we led that. And by the time we agreed on the, st the strategic plan and were ready to start negotiating, I had just become very involved and the council suggested that I 
take the role of co-chair for the negotiations team. So that was a long answer, sorry, but it was a complicated process. It actually took two years from the time we started on this to the time we started negotiations. So uh, it was there was quite a bit of work that went on. And as I got more and more involved, my colleagues thought it made sense and asked me to be the co-chair. I think my training as an economist, I think, was one advantage I had and one thing they appreciated having there in getting into negotiations over multi-million dollar uh, publishing agreements with publishers. They saw that as one of the advantages to have that on the team. Can you, uh, can you also talk to us a little bit about how you chose um, who to enter into these transformative open access agreements or negotiations with? Because uh, sure. it sounds daunting, but I imagine it all started <laughs> with one step. So where, where did you all begin and, and how did you pick the pick those partners? Um, the Partly by happenstance, uh, most of these big agreements, the system wide agreements uh, that you know run into the millions of dollars are multi year subscription agreements um, and as it happens. In the year we launched negotiations that we moved from strategic planning to action was 2018 and that year our five-year agreement with Elsevier was expiring um, and Elsevier as I think you all know is the largest scholarly publisher in the world and it was our largest contract um, so that one was expiring as were many others you know they we have a lot of agreements um, but they were the largest they also are widely viewed as the uh, least well liked of all scholarly publishers. They really, there's a lot of uh, anger at Elsevier in the academic community over their prices and practices over the years. Um, they they have the highest profit rate. They're they're charging the uh, you know most exorbitant prices uh, and a number of other things. So both because it was possible, we didn't want to enter another long-term subscription agreement since we're trying to transform our agreements into publishing agreements, and we needed something with Elsevier. We needed to work with them. Um, it turns out we didn't need something right away, but we we certainly had to address the fact that our subscription was expiring. Uh, the fact that it was the biggest and so it would make a splash if we succeeded and that they were so disliked, which sort of helped us. We have to bring along our coalition if we're going to change things and possibly walk away from contracts, which we did in this case. We needed the support of the faculty and, and students uh, to uh, go along with those changes and, and possibly the disruption. And the fact that Elsevier is so disliked helps with that. If you're going to go after anybody, you go after somebody that people don't like uh, or a company that people don't like. So that turned out to really just be a very convenient uh, confluence of things. Uh, I also it, personally am a, a risk taker and don't mind breaking a few eggs uh, to make things happen. So I, as the co-chair, I right from the beginning said, yeah, let's go after Elsevier let's, uh, and let's be prepared to walk away if we need to. That's the only way we're really going to have leverage. Um, and I, I just didn't mind uh, the, the risks associated with that. So I pushed a bit on that, as, as did others. Other than that, and we've got 10 agreements now with a number of different publishers that we've negotiated over the last two years, um, it partly is based on which agreements are coming up for renewal so that you know it's timely to negotiate with them. We are trying to develop, we've actually got principles and, and a set of criteria for selecting which publishers we will negotiate with at a given time. One of the criteria is that we want a balanced portfolio. We don't just want to go after the large for-profit publishers because ultimately we're trying to create a level playing field that all publishers are treated the same so that we don't bias for or against any of them with our authors, with our faculty and students. So we have been selecting publishers based on this sort of matrix of criteria. Depends on how big they are, because that's impact, but it also depends on whether they're profit or nonprofit. We're trying to get a mixture of those, whether they're traditional subscription publishers or they're more uh, modern open access publishers, uh, so that we can try to have a portfolio of agreements. And, and that's what we've been doing. We've got agreements, for instance, with the Cambridge University Press, which is, of course, a nonprofit. It's a university press. They publish mostly humanities and social science journals. That's another thing. We wanted some disciplinary spread. Uh, we've got agreements with Elsevier and Springer Nature, the two largest publishers, uh, both of them for profit. We've got agreements with uh, PLOS, which is a pure open access publisher, and JMIR, also a pure open access publisher, and that one's relatively small. So we've got small, large professional society for profit. Uh, and uh, we're, we're selecting them each year as we go along based on who's available to negotiate with that year and how they fit into our matrix of developing a balanced portfolio of these things as we move towards 100% open access. 
So uh, without, without giving away current uh, negotiation inside information, who, uh, who's on your list that, that you'd like to develop uh, a relationship with that you currently do not have a relationship with? So you know, who's, sure. uh, who's, on the, who's on the list? Well, first of all, the easy answer is everybody because we are aiming towards 100% open access. But in the near term, um, uh, and some of this we've talked about, so it's not, I'm not giving anything away. Uh, the, the most obvious big one now is Wiley. They're the third largest publisher in the world. We've signed agreements with the top two. Uh, Wiley's the third largest. And we actually have been working with Wiley, and we've been uh, quite open about that. And, and uh, uh, they've been fairly cooperative. They're trying to move towards more open access publishing. Um, the other big ones uh, that are sort of obvious in, those, in the category of large publishers are Taylor and Francis uh, and the um, American Chemical Society, which is a society publisher, but it's so big and it sells very heavily into the for-profit pharmaceutical industry that they tend to act a bit more like a for-profit commercial publisher. Um, they would present they wouldn't agree with that, but that's our opinion. Um, so they're, they're the, some of the big ones that are on the list. Um, but other scholarly publishers, uh, uh, societies, um, and at that point, really is uh, who's available and, and uh, uh, who's there to, who's there, as I said, who's coming up for agreement, who's got interest in the possibility of such negotiations. And we're this year working with about three or four others. I can't mention them all at the moment, but uh, again, it's a mixture. We keep working with, uh, with a mix. We are about to announce one that is with a nonprofit, a very prestigious nonprofit uh, publisher that we're very excited about. It's, it's one of the more prestigious publishers, relatively modest in size, but extraordinarily prestigious. And we're really excited about that. So is that a stay tuned? We should follow you on Twitter. Uh, that will be <laughs> the first place that it's announced. <laughs> uh, Probably, yes. Uh, so uh, so uh, before I turn this over to one of our participants, Roshon is going to ask a question. Uh, we all contain multitudes here. We celebrate that in this space. Uh, could you tell folks about your love of music? You're a musician, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a classical pianist, uh, amateur, but but a serious amateur. I, I've been, uh, took a long break in the middle of my uh, life, but I came back to it some years ago and I practice every day and take weekly lessons, uh, play across the whole classical repertoire. Wonderful. Roshan, can, uh, can you turn on your camera and go ahead and ask your question? Hi, Jeff. Uh, we chatted a bit before we came in and I'm also a uh, U of M alum. And um, so I, while at U of M, I was, part of the design lab there, and it was, was part of the, the library. And, um, and it just seems that with like negotiations, like there's also, like there's some conflict, there could be some conflict that also emerges. So I was just wondering, and like these negotiations, what kind of uh, conflict may come up, whether it's conflict of interest or some some other type of conflict. And, and then also think about conflict, uh, it seems not. It seems like you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes with these negotiations and an open access. And I think for the average student, they don't see that work in the same way that they may see books on a shelf in a physical library. Just wondering if they have. Has there been any talks of like how to make the work that you're doing more transparent? And because I think for students, if they don't have access to um, a digital source that they'll ask a friend or they'll go another route and just wondering if like this transparency could help people understand the importance of open, open source, but then also the, the importance of like not having an open source at a institution. Okay, um, so uh, basically, it's, I think two, two questions, one about conflict, one about transparency and communicating. I'll try to remember to cover them both, follow up if I, if I don't cover it all. Um, on conflict, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, I mean, for one thing, when you're talking about any sort of uh, agreement to pay something, you've got two different sides of that. And of course, the seller wants you to pay more and the buyer wants you to pay less. And then there are all the other terms in this case, we're actually arguing with the publishers about what we're paying for. In the subscription world, we're paying for the privilege of reading 
science, some of which we wrote. Uh, in the case of University of California, we wrote quite a bit of it, and then we're paying to actually have let other people in the university have the right to read it, which sounds a little bit strange. Uh, but we're trying to change that so that we're paying for publishing, that we pay the cost of the publishing, but then let everybody read our research for free. So we, uh, there's, you know, there are definitely uh, different interests between the publishers and the universities, and, and that's why it's a negotiation, because they want one set of things and we want uh, something certainly different in terms of price and possibly different in terms of the business model, what we're paying for. Um, th those conflicts, to some extent, have been pretty public, although you, you know, it doesn't mean that people necessarily follow what's going on in journal negotiations, but they've gotten a fair bit of press, especially in the uh, academic uh, press and, uh, and also in uh, more general press like the LA Times and uh, you know various other national newspapers. Um, you know, the biggest thing, and I mentioned this when we were thinking about Elsevier, is that, uh, you know, if we don't like what the seller is selling, the publisher in this case, we don't have to buy. We can walk away. Now, walking away from a subscription to the largest publisher of scientific articles is not an easy thing to do because that means we don't have direct access to those articles from the publisher. They're copyrighted, they publish them, uh, and they turn off the access to their server. But, uh, you know, that's possible. And indeed, that's what ended up happening in the Elsevier negotiation for two years. We did not have a subscription agreement with them or a publishing agreement with them. Um, that was a pretty heated negotiation. They really, you know, they are the strongest. They have a lot of market power, monopoly power. Uh, they were not at all happy with what we were proposing. They had no other agreements in the world of the sort we were proposing at the time. Uh, and we were also, we were very unhappy about the prices they were charging. So it was pretty heated. There were actually some really, actually fairly ugly moments during negotiations. I, I won't give, I can't go into details, but uh, you know, negotiations can be pretty tough and uh, people can say things that uh, uh, maybe they shouldn't say. Um, and then we had a pretty public divorce. Uh, it was, you know, that was, we got over, there were over 200 stories published about uh, our canceling our contract because we're such a big academic institution and they're such a big publisher this really shook the world up it, 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 when i came to berkeley i asked what happens if we walk away from elsevier as i said i don't mind breaking a few eggs to get something done and my colleagues said you'll be fired the next day you're, you're the scholars the faculty and the students need to read these articles and you can't walk away from a subscription well after three years of work, we figured out that we could walk away from it. There were alternatives available, and, and you actually alluded to some restraint, and I'll get to that in a minute. So it was pretty contentious. I'll also mention there's other conflict. Um, you know, not every single faculty member in an institution that has over 10,000 faculty members uh, has the same view on things. Not every single graduate student has the same view. Of course, uh, there's widespread support for open access, but some people don't care about it that much, uh, and some, and they really do care about having access to reading the article. So they're really upset if the uh, subscription gets cut off, and we have to. Uh, that's why it took so long to build the coalition. And before we went into negotiations, we needed to make sure we had widespread support, so that if we did walk away from the table, um, we wouldn't get fired the next day. Uh, that we would be doing something the university wanted us to do, and the faculty and students could rally behind. So there are there some conflicts, you know, within our ranks. Uh, we have, that's what coalition building is all about. And you're not going to have everybody agreeing about everything all the time, of course. Um, and that's actually leads to your next question, I think, about transparency and, and communications. Part of what we were doing during the two years we were developing our strategic plan for negotiations was building up our communications effort. Um, uh, we have professional communicators working in the libraries to help us advertise what we do, do outreach, to communicate with donors, for instance. We raise a lot of philanthropic gifts. Um, but we turned our communication teams also to supporting uh, the open access movement and our new strategy and really the world leadership position that the University of California decided to take. We're really one of the most advanced and aggressive uh, in academic institutions now on open access. So we got our communicators uh, educated on this. Um, and we have. Uh, somebody on all 10 campuses who's responsible for local communications, as well as our core team of a couple of the experts from, from the campuses who are the core team for the system now for this. And when we had, when there were 200 articles published, that was a lot of interviews and a lot of press contacts, for instance, and they were working full time. We uh, develop press releases. We have a website where we publish information. And we're being very transparent and very, uh, we're trying really hard to do outreach. We 
refuse to sign any agreements that aren't public. We will now only sign contracts that we can publish and no non-disclosure agreements about the contracts. Uh, we inform people about the state of negotiations, not details from the negotiating room, um, but we keep people informed about who we're negotiating with uh, uh, most of the time and what we're trying to accomplish. We're explicit about our goals. That also is not just transparency, but accountability. We tell uh, the world, including our faculty and students, what our goals are in our negotiations. Uh, we tell them that publicly it's on our website and that way they can hold us accountable if we end up signing agreements that do something different. Uh, we held a lot of town halls on all 10 campuses, uh, inviting uh, faculty and students to come and learn about what we were doing and asking questions and keeping them informed. We had web pages devoted specifically to this, particularly when we canceled the Elsevier agreement. Uh, we had a web page on every campus about what we call alternative access, how you can get to the articles you need to read, even though we don't have subscription, how you can get to them legally. Um, and there are ways to do that. And we provided that support. So it was lots and lots of communication and, and we're a public institution. We generally are pretty transparent. And I believe in that completely that there should be nothing that we're doing except what goes on in the negotiating room. Because if you talk about details from the room while you're trying to do the negotiations that undercuts the negotiations. There's a certain uh, strategic need to allow uh, a certain amount of confidentiality for those discussions so that you can throw out ideas and you can bat things back and forth and figure it out. But then everything else we are completely transparent about and, and proactively so we do a lot would do a lot of outreach and communications to let people know what we're doing and to make sure they're on board with us and that they're well informed. I am going to uh, jump in with the next question. Uh, and I, I know uh, um, in, in, your, in your career, you spend a lot of time on, uh, on the big picture, on the forest, and I'm hoping you'll join me next to a tree for a few minutes. <laughs> so there are all sorts of ways uh, that uh, ingenious, not me, uh, people work around uh, not having access to articles. It's, there may be Facebook groups, uh, you know, there may be websites where you can find books and things like that. <laughs> so I think about how far um, um, we've come, the fact that we're having this discussion since uh, 2011 when Aaron Schwartz was arrested uh, for what uh, immense downloads of articles, JSTOR articles at MIT, which I know is, is your alma mater. Um, and I, I'm hoping uh, that you can talk a little bit about how you think what we're talking about here will affect the day-to-day -day lives of uh, PhD students, there are some of those here in the room, uh, junior faculty, some of those in the room, there are even some undergraduates here in the room with us, and, and also just the access to knowledge in, in, in places that can't even imagine having Elsevier access, you know, so uh, can you talk about what the day to day change might look like for those folks. Sure. Um, it, it's, it's a complicated landscape. Uh, and as you alluded to earlier, or Shun did, it's, it, a lot of it's behind the scenes. Um, you know, a lot of people don't, and I think this is maybe even more true in the hard sciences than the social sciences and humanities, a lot of people don't actually realize that their access to most scientific or, you know, scholarly journal publications is through the library. They go to the, they turn on their browser, they go to a particular website to get access to an article, and they don't realize that they wouldn't have that access unless the library had paid for a subscription uh, and had negotiated a license and provided that finding aid and so, so forth. Um, so most scientific literature, almost all of it is, well, all of it really is copyright. It's just a question of who owns the copyright. Most of it, the copyright is still owned by the publisher, that authors turn the copyright over to the publisher in exchange for the publisher publishing the article. Um, so that's the standard mode. That means that that final version, the final published version, the publisher is the only one who has the legal right to make a copy available for you to read. So if you want a legal copy of the final published version, you have to generally get it from the publisher with the exception of the open access journals, which are increasing, but are still a relatively small fraction. Um, there are other legal ways to get access to the content of those articles. Um, and then there are illegal ways to do it, uh, ways that violate copyright. And I, I don't mean that in a judgment sense. I'm not judging anybody, but with copyright law is what it is uh, in the US and different variations on in other countries. So, um, the normal easiest way is if an institution has a subscription with a publisher and has access to their server and either through the library's catalog or by going directly to that publisher and logging in with them as being part of 
the University of California, Berkeley or whatever, you get access to the articles. That's the easiest way it gets you the final version of the article with the page numbers, the correct citation and so forth. Um, it also allows for certain types of research that are hard to do if you don't go that route. For instance, if you're in a research group, uh, you might be assigned to be the person to skim the table of contents when a new issue comes out, read the articles that seem relevant to your research lab's work, summarize those articles for your whole research group, and then download the two that you think everybody should read. So, you know, you may be going through 40 articles and winnowing it down to two. That's hard to do if you have to go find each article individually rather than just skim through the table of contents and click, 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 click on the articles. You know, you can do it much faster. So there are different types of work that are possible uh, depending on whether or not you get access to the publisher's version with the whole table of contents or you have to go out and find one article at a time. But if you don't have a subscription, if you cancel a subscription or your institution doesn't can't afford to have subscriptions to everything, which actually no institution does, even the University of California doesn't subscribe to everything, um, then you have to go find things one by one. One legal way to do that is to just buy the article. You don't have to buy a subscription to the, high, the whole journal. Almost all publishers will sell you individual articles although typically they charge you $30 or more per article. So this is not something that most people can afford to do, but that's an option. Um, another way is to find what we still somewhat anachronistically call preprints, since most of these aren't printed on paper, but it's a version of the article before the final publication and before the copyright has been transferred to the publisher. So it's the more formal term we usually use for that is the author accepted manuscript. It's gone through review, it's been accepted for publication, but the author still owns the copyright. They haven't transferred that copyright to the publisher yet. Because they still own the copyright on that version, it's not got the final formatting, it doesn't have the page numbers, it doesn't have the final copy editing, but it's been accepted and peer reviewed. So presumably it's correct, as correct as you know things ever are. Uh, those authors can make those available. So you can email an author and ask them to give you an article. And we authors like people to read what we write. So usually we'll immediately say, yes, it's very easy to send a PDF. It takes only a moment. So you send it along. That's a very easy way to get it. But it's one article at a time, you know, and finding the authors. Uh, another way is the authors might put the preprints on an open access preprint server, uh, which are growing and people are probably very familiar with them now. Archive is one of the most famous. There's also now BioArchive and SochArchive. Most institutions have their own institutional. In California, we have something called e-scholarship for our own research in preprint form. So they may be on a server and you can just go search. And Google Scholar actually does a really good job of harvesting those and indexing them. And so Google Scholar is a good way to find preprints. Um, uh, then the other, the next thing is sort of the gray market. You can go out and you can ask, does anybody have a PDF of this? Uh, people do this on Twitter all the time. In fact, there's a hashtag, I, uh, I can has PDF is a common hashtag on uh, Twitter where people will ask, does anybody have a copy of this? That's probably violating copyright law because the person who sent you the copy probably doesn't have the right to do that unless they're the author and it's a preprint. But people do that. I call it gray market because it's, you know, it's sort of, questionable a little bit. And then there are pirate sites. Um, uh, the, the most famous is uh, called SciHub, which is uh, run by a Russian woman. Um, and uh, it has, uh, much like Aaron Swartz did, it quite clearly illegally gets access to uh, copies of articles, downloads them, and has created a uh, collection of, of, of millions and millions of articles. It's really quite extraordinarily complete. Uh, and it's out there. It's But we know that it violates copyright law, but it's there and people can go find articles there. So there are lots of different ways to get to them. Um, the institution, the library and the university support the legal ways. We're not going to support uh, things that we know violate copyright law, but we will back it up. We'll tell people if you need a copy and you can't find it yourself, come to the library, we will get it for you. And in the worst case, we'll buy you the article at $30 a uh, copy um, so that you can get your research done. We'll, we'll back you up on that. So lots of different ways to do it. So Todd is up next. Uh, Todd had a question for you. Hi, Todd. Hi, yes, thank you so much. Um, you actually touched on a lot of what I was going to ask um, in your response to Nanette's question. And I guess then my question is for emerging scholars or researchers, what do you have any recommendations on good places to look to understand what is within your right, if it's a little bit like in legal ease when you get your first publication and you, you're not sure where you can share. I know in my case, there's ResearchGate, 
which is another place where um, scholars often upload work. And I think I got a request and I just kind of refused because I just erred on being as cautious as possible. So um, I guess now I'm thinking there's probably your university library, but are there other places that you think are good resources to look into to understand your rights as a scholar to share your work? Yeah, I think generally across academia, the, the most reliable place to check from most people is going to be with your university library because most university libraries have at least one librarian who specializes in copyright and scholarly communications and can advise you on you know what what you should do or what you can do with your own publications as well as what you can do for getting other people so you can get that and, and many institutions have a web page uh, at their library website that summarizes information and provides links to uh, more detailed background so that's probably the best sort of one-stop shopping thing is to check in and you know if you, if you have trouble finding it on a university's library website just contact one of the librarians and ask them and they'll point you to the right person um there are also other uh, uh you know websites and information sources uh that do this uh, collect this information and prevent present it on the web one problem with that is you know you may not know who's reliable that you're going to you know your university library you can probably trust because uh they have a paid professional who's been working on this unless you're an expert in this field already you know just finding things on the web is a little bit dicey especially when you're talking about legal advice uh, so i'd be a little cautious about that um the you know the the, other, the, the one of the basic things that all scholars should be aware of is to pay attention to intellectual property rights try to be aware of your own rights particularly around your own writings um when you start publishing or if you are publishing at some point, you will be signing agreements with publishers. You will be signing an agreement that allows them to publish your work because you own the copyright into, unless you give it to somebody else. It, you own it, it's intellectual property. You can transfer it to somebody else, but until you do, it's yours. So they can't publish your articles unless you give them permission. And there's going to be some sort of written agreement that they ask you to sign. Read that agreement, see what it says. And in almost all cases, it's going to say you transfer all or most of the copyright, copyright actually is a package of rights you have, but it'll say what rights you're transferring to them. And at that point, they own the rights to share copies of that, of that, of the thing that they publish. I mean, and the agreement will say, you know, the final, the final published version is what we have, you know, what the publisher has the right over. So up until you sign that agreement, everything you've done, you own the rights to. After you sign that agreement, the version that the publisher adds value to and you know the final formatting and editing and so forth they own the rights to usually i mean you have to read the agreement to be sure of that so read those agreements and know and uh you know make your own value judgments about what you want to do um i've i will admit i've shared the copyrighted version of some of my articles you know one at a time uh, or in an institutional repository if it's been published for a number of years i i don't think that's that bad of an issue but some of the sharing i've done probably has violated copyright and i just decided that wasn't a big enough deal and if a publisher complained i would back down i wasn't really making a political point just was more convenient frankly but i but at least i knew i was doing that and i was aware of which things i own rights to and which i don't so uh you know pay attention to that it, it, it might matter and if you care about open access which is to say publishing things so that people can read it for free they don't have to pay for it then Make sure you're signing agreements that something will be published open access. Publish it with a publisher who will publish it open access, um, which may be a traditional publisher, uh, depending on the agreement your institution has with them, or whether you pay an open access publishing fee. But, but um, you know, be aware of what you're doing, uh, and make sure it aligns with your values, or at least you understand what compromises you're making if you feel like you need to make a compromise. Can you also talk a little bit about IP and data? Uh, so um, I, I know uh, that that crosses over into your universe. Uh, the you know the library owns and creates quite quite a bit of data, especially at Berkeley. Um, it's my understanding that as graduate students and faculty and affiliates, uh, that with the creation of of, of data, there's uh, there's you don't outright own uh, own it. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Let me, at this point, especially remind you all, I'm not a lawyer. I'm an economist. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. And so this is not formal legal advice. And I'm, I'm I, particularly on data, I'm not an expert on the uh, intellectual property law. I, I 
have some exposure to and some knowledge, but I want to be particularly careful here. Um, the general principle in the US is that data itself, the underlying numbers, facts, words, whatever form of data you're talking about, um, the data itself cannot be copyrighted because it's in some sense, it's just a fact of the universe. You know, these are facts. They're not something that somebody created. They didn't create the facts. They didn't uh, uh, author it. It's not a creative work. So you, you can only copyright creative works, things that were created by humans. And the facts aren't created by humans. The facts are what they are. What you can copyright is the presentation of data. You can organize it into a database. You can provide a user interface. You can provide tools for analyzing or manipulating the database. So you can copyright a, a data product, if you will, um, which would be a packaged up set of data with uh, you know, various formats and tools and so forth. Um, and then you have to license that. Um, so, so you can do that, uh, but you can't copyright the underlying data. So for instance, what we call proprietary data, um, you know, business data, um, that might be protected by trade secret. They don't have to reveal it. There's no requirement. In fact, they're very much not required to reveal it if they don't want to. But if they do reveal it, they can't stop it that, at that point. They can't control it. So they won't give you proprietary data to do research, for instance, without very strict agreements that you won't share it with anybody. And that's a license, that's a contract. That's not the, the copyright law isn't protecting them. It's just a contract between you and them. They didn't have to give it to you in the first place. If they do, they're gonna put some very strong restrictions on what you can do with it. So data is tricky and the, the data you generate in your research lab, uh, for instance, again, the underlying data is not copyrighted if you, publish it, anybody can use it and reuse it. They can't, you can't stop them from using that data. Um, but if again, if you create a database and you package it up and you want to sell it, you can do that. But for the most part, academics don't do that. You know, academics mostly make their data, well, either they don't make it available because it's too much work and too much effort and maybe nobody asks them for it. But, you know, we tend to be uh, very free about our data and not try to package it up and put intellectual property rights around it usually. And when we uh, when we post this video, we will make sure that we put not a lawyer right under you as <laughs> Thank when, you. when we hit that point. You've got that. Yeah, right, don't so do this a, at home, kids. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a I'm sure when you became an economist, you didn't realize you'd be talking this much about legal elements. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, we have a question from Maxine. Uh, Maxine wasn't able to be with us today, but sent the following question. I was curious about UC's efforts to get researchers to self archive and pu publish open access how they get more faculty buy-in and participation. I've noticed a huge culture shift from when I was an undergrad at UCLA 10 years ago to now a grad student at UCSD. And I'm curious how that actually happened on the ground, so to speak. Sure, that's a great question. Um, that That's one of the reasons that the University of California has been able to be such an aggressive leader on open access policy. It was, it was a grassroots bottom-up effort led by the faculty, um, particularly it, the, the faculty in UC being a public institution have, you know, always generally been pretty public spirited and pretty, or, or, you know, we do our research so that the world will be a better place. And we want people to know what our research is and we want them to read it. So that open access spirit is sort of natural for all academics. And it's been especially strong in the UC for a long time. And the UC has been fighting some battles with publishers about access since the early 2000s. But not, but not big ones until the 2010s. And in the early 2010s, um, leaders in the faculty community around scholarly communication issues uh, organized a uh, move and got the academic senate, which is the governing body of the faculty for the university, to pass a resolution requiring open access for all UC authored, uh, faculty authored scholarship, it was a faculty rule, um, which meant that uh, the faculty imposed on themselves in 2013 a policy that we are all required to make our author accepted manuscript, our preprint version that we legally own before it's published, uh, available open access uh, through some open access server. And the default is eScholarship, I mentioned the UC uh, repository. So that's a policy that the faculty from the bottom up decided that they wanted and, and approved and passed. I say they, because I wasn't here at the time. I am a faculty member, but I wasn't here yet. Um, so they, they established this policy requiring everybody to deposit their work in a server so that it's available open access. 
Um, since then, the president has extended that policy to cover all researchers employed, so not just faculty, but graduate student research assistants, uh, various other uh, researchers who are not faculty members uh, are covered as well by the same policy now uh, issued by the president's office. Now, compliance with that is another issue. This is a rule, but it doesn't have any teeth. There's no enforcement mechanism. Uh, you aren't going to lose your tenure if you don't uh, uh, put your articles up. It's it's the faculty said, we, we, we insist that we do this, but if we don't do this, you know, there's no punishment. Um, so what has largely happened is that the university libraries have worked to support this and make it as easy as possible for the faculty. And in fact, we uh, license a database that gives us alerts on any newly published articles by UC authors. Uh, this database goes through all publishers output and checks who the authors are and what institution they're with. And so we every month send out notices to UC authors when they have published a new article saying, we see you've published this new article. Have you put your copy into the server? And if not, you can do that and click on this link to do so. And then, you know, and if you need instructions, here are instructions. So we're supporting it and encouraging it by reminding people that this policy is in place and that the faculty put it on themselves and then giving them support, trying to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. And indeed, if you need help, here's a librarian you can contact who will actually help you directly. So we try to make it as easy as possible and encourage people and keep reminding them that this is something we all want to do. Let's take the effort to do it. It's not, doesn't take that much time. Compliance still is modest. I would say, I think we currently count about 25% of UC articles get deposited this way. Um, the highest I've heard anywhere in the US is MIT where they've gotten their deposit rate up to about 50%, I think, in their server. Um, and they really push their faculty hard on it. Um, so that's the problem with volunteer systems. You know, people, it's, it's, it all sounds good. Yes, we're all for it, but are we actually going to go to the bother of doing it in the end? Um, and that's the reason that we've been now pushing more for open access of the final published version where we can require it through the publisher agreements um, where everything will be open access uh, that is published by UC authors uh, if we succeed. Roshan, why don't you uh, turn your camera on and ask our next question? Oh, hi, Jeff. Um, I was, I watched your video and it's just, I realized like there was a, there's a ton of money that's being poured into the library. And, um, and then I think with Elsevier, like there was a, a moment where I think they, it was a new CEO. And so like things kind of happened. Um, and I also, I was just wondering also if there is collaboration with like local public libraries or other entities um, uh, with like the the digital like digital a uh, access. So um, yeah, this is kind of like self serving just because since being a student, I very rarely go to public libraries. So I'm just wondering if there is um, a relationship there with any um outside of the university sure um first I, i'm not sure quite what you meant or who, who told you there was a ton of money being poured into libraries that's not true uh li library budgets well, have been under a lot of pressure and have been steadily cut faster than budgets of higher education generally you know the, especially public education uh the amount of money that our society is contributing per student for public universities is going down steadily and has been for 20 years. And unfortunately the funding for libraries is going down even faster. And that's part of the problem is we can't afford the journal subscriptions anymore. Uh, not all of them, um, but- uh, I, think I, I, think, I think I misspoke. I meant to say like uh, that the libraries are spending a lot, oh, a lot yeah, of that, money. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Like, I think it was like $504 million or something along those lines, like it was, um, yeah, yeah, the, the, or, the or spending they're pouring a lot. Of, yeah, like they're pouring a lot of money out. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That I agree with. We're pouring a lot of money into the publishers pockets. Um, right. and, and actually one of the frustrating things because the publishers have so much market power or monopoly power, as we economists say, um, they've been raising their prices faster than general inflation. And this is really effective. For one thing, people who rely heavily on books instead of journal articles, so particularly people in the humanities and, and some of the social sciences, um, the journal prices have been going up faster than anything else. 
uh, including tuition and other sources of funding for libraries. And so to keep up with journal publications, we've been able to spend less money on books. And that's been a really significant effect. And it's really become quite, that's another area of conflict, by the way, is, uh, you know, the tension on campuses between how much we spend on journals and how much we spend on books. Um, as far as cooperating with other libraries, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm an economist. I'm not, a, I haven't been in the library world for very long, um, but I'm not aware of much activity, at least in access, between academic institutions and public libraries, um, which may seem surprising. But if you think about it, we have a pretty different audiences and, and somewhat different missions. Um, you know, the, the scientific journal articles are something that public libraries just don't provide access to. They can't afford it and there isn't much demand for it, frankly, uh, at, at the public library. So they don't subscribe to hardly any uh, scientific journals, maybe Science Magazine, because it's sort of a general purpose and one of the most prestigious and lets people know who are scientifically literate, what's going on in the world of science. There may be a few others, but the literally over 100,000 scientific journals that are out there, we, we count about 125,000 scientific journals. Uh, almost all of those are not subscribed to by public libraries and they're not interested in it. They So they aren't interested in joining us in a consortium to you know increase our buying power um, where we do see cooperation uh, is between different levels of universities and colleges so university of california is a research university all 10 campuses are very research intensive we also have the cal state university which is about 30 or so um, uh, universities that are sort of the the middle tier they're more teaching institutions they also do research but it's you know more focus on teaching and a bit less on research so they don't publish as much per author you know per for faculty member um they do license access because they're teaching high level teaching institution they need to be able to read the journals and so they subscribe to a lot um we're uh we have some joint agreements uh, with publishers that include us and the Cal State University so that we have not just the University of California, but all of the Cal State campuses as well. And we're working right now on trying to expand that and do more joint negotiations with them. We're also working with a consortium of private colleges in California um, to see if we can join forces with them so that we basically have an all California consortium to increase our buying power and to then share uh, the journal titles legally across all of the campuses in California. So the, uh, that's actually very common in Europe. And it's one reason that some of the European countries have made faster progress on open access than we have in the US. The, in Europe, it's quite common to have nationwide consortia that all the universities and colleges in the nation, research and teaching institutions, uh, function. At, they're all public. They're all in Europe, almost all of the institutions are public which is to say owned by the government. And so they work together as one entity often uh, and do their negotiations for you know, hundreds of institutions across a country. And that gives them more leverage and uh, you know, better outcomes often because they're sharing that. So we see that more in, in trying to build consortia across different types of academic institutions, but not so much across the academic uh, public library uh, boundary. Now, there are other things that academic libraries do with public libraries in their region for various different things. I just don't see it around this area of, of the big licenses because the public libraries, for the most part, don't need or want the licenses to the scientific journals. Is that in, is that in part because some universities continue to provide access to their alumni to journals and such? Why people, so people who might be scientifically inclined would still be able to get that access even if they leave the academic community? Um, that's a good question, Nanny, and it's, it's, that's almost right. Um, what it, it isn't actually the case that hardly any university provides journal access to its alumni because we can't afford it. We basically pay for subscriptions based on the number of readers, users we have. So at Berkeley, we have you know roughly 20,000 between, or sorry, uh, roughly 60,000 between faculty, researchers, and students. So we're basically paying for 60,000 readers. Well, Berkeley has 500,000 living alumni. So if we wanted to negotiate a license that we could share with our alumni, suddenly we'd be paying for 560,000 people instead of 60,000 people. And you can imagine what that would do to our budget. So uh, alumni ask us all the time, can, why can't you share access? And the answer is because 
you're not paying us and we don't have the money. You know, we, we can't afford it. Uh, uh, we're sorry. We wish we could. But that's why we're doing open access so that everybody will have access. We want everybody to be able to read without having to pay. But we can't pay on behalf of everybody. We don't have the funds to do that. Um, the, 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 almost, the almost right part is, and this has more to do with the public libraries, um, we are allowed to, uh, under all of our licenses, to let anybody who comes and uses one of our campus computers to have access. In other words, you don't have to be, it's not, we're not really licensing for the number of individuals so much as the number of users, including the fact that we have public access. So anybody in Berkeley, the city of Berkeley, who wants to access scientific journals can come to the Berkeley campus and sit down at a library workstation in our public libraries. Our libraries are open to the public. They can sit down and, and access it there. So that's just as convenient as going downtown to the Berkeley Public Library. That's another, that, so that is a reason why the Berkeley Public Library wouldn't want to license it because people can just go up the street to campus and, and use it at our site rather than use it at their site. Um, so it, it works just as well in that, in that way. And Todd is going to get the final word. Our final question comes from Todd Hall. Hello again. And Hi, I now have a, a two part question because this conversation is very interesting, but it's, I'll, I'll tie it together. Um, so my background is also in economics and it was interesting watching your video about the, the green versions or the pre-publication versions. So I was thinking about the NDER, National Bureau of Economic Research working papers. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, what you, if you saw any role for professional organizations in helping get more scholars to provide their works um, in an open access format. And relatedly, this is my second part. Um, I'm currently funded by the Institute for Education Sciences. And as a requirement, I have to upload my, um, any manuscripts that are, are pre-publication to ERIC, which is their online database. And so, my first part of the question is, do you, what do you see as the role, if any, for professional organizations? And also, is there a push from funders and, and grant makers to push scholars more toward public, um, publishing their works, open access, and even providing some accountability in doing that? Those are great questions. And the, the, answer to, the short answer to both is yes. Um, Professional societies uh, being made up, of course, of the scholars who are generating the research in the first place have an interest in that research being read. And uh, much as I said that, you know, academics in general have wanted open access since the early 90s, uh, professional societies often uh, take that as a stance and, and are advocates for it. There is a tension. A lot of professional societies publish journals themselves. They are also publishers. And their model of... Uh, paying the cost of that are subscriptions because that's been the traditional business model. And in fact, many professional societies, uh, they actually make a profit on journals because that's how journal pricing works and they can, they can do that. And then they use that profit since they're a nonprofit organization to subsidize other activities within the society, such as, for example, travel grants for graduate students to conferences. You know, a lot of societies have either discounted fees for students to go to conferences or offer travel grants uh, so if you, to, to subsidize the travel to them. And that's usually coming from profits they make on their journals. So on the one hand, the societies do generally want their authors to make their work available, but at the same time as publishers, they often want to restrict that access so that they can charge for it and make some money. So there's some tension there, but there are organizations that push for this just as a matter of organizational principle and NBR where a number of my early works uh, were published in the NBR working paper series uh, when I was doing public finance. Uh, and that is an organization that does freely distribute uh, its uh, work and it makes it easy and encourages people to do that. The funding, as far as funding agencies, um, that's a really good question. And the answer to that is increasingly across the world, funding agencies are implementing policies requiring at least distribution of the preprint open access, much like the University of California policy uh, for our authors. Um, most of the US federal funding agencies, for example, do require that just as uh, yours does, uh, that you deposit a copy in at least some open access repository before the final published version. Um, if you're a biomedical researcher, you have to uh, uh, submit it. Uh, if you have NIH funding, you have to submit it into what's called PubMed and make it available through that service. Uh, the NSF requires you to submit it. They don't require a specific repository, but 
e-scholarship or archive or one of the others, you have to do it. Um, and they actually can enforce that, and some of them do. The NIH is pretty good about it. You're not going to get a grant renewed unless you've made all of your previously uh, funded articles available open access, and they actually check so that uh, biomedical authors are quite good about that deposit rate because they want their next grant to come through. So funding agencies can encourage it. The big issue is who's going to pay for it, who's going to pay for publication instead of subscriptions. And in the U.S., the funding agencies have been reluctant to do that. They will let you use some of your grant funds to pay individual author publishing fees. Uh, so if you want to publish your article open access and you have a grant from NSF or NIH, uh, you can use funds in that grant for that instead of for something else like conference travel. Um, but they generally are not paying the publishers directly for the publishing costs. And they're instead saying publish green, take the preprint version and make that available uh, and then let the publisher do whatever they want with the final version and let them charge for it. In Europe, it's a bit different. Uh, there are about 13 countries in Europe that have joined something called Coalition S, uh, which has a policy called Plan S that requires everybody who gets funding from one of the those 13 national funding uh, agencies to publish the final version open access and requires journals to accept those articles as open access publications. And the Coalition S funding agencies will pay for that cost. They will directly pay for it uh, as part of their funding. So they've moved more in that direction. And that's, again, accelerating things. It's moving things ahead faster because the money is being uh, provided by the government funding agencies. So that's figuring out where that money is going to come from and redirecting the money we're currently spending on subscriptions into paying instead for publishing is really the trick. And as we gradually figure out how to move the money from one place to another, the money's there. The publishers are making a living. We just have to move it from paying for subscriptions to paying for funding. And funding agencies are helping with that, but at different rates. And in the US, they aren't quite there on the funding side yet. They're there more on the preprint uh, side. But in Europe, they're uh, much more aggressive on the funding side. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, you're, you're making me think uh, that, that we need to make sure we have funding available for our participants uh, here uh, for, for them to make their publications that come out of this work uh, open access. So that, that's something I'm going to look into. Thank you. Really exceptional presentation. I, I thank you, and I'm sure many of the participants here, those that asked questions and, and, and those that, uh, that uh, hung and heard your non-legal advice, uh, really appreciate your, your being here. So thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.